Welcome everybody to the Monthly Movie Dispatch, the show where we get together and we talk about what we've seen, what we like, what we don't like, and just what we recommend to you. The thing that differentiates us from the other 100,000 movie shows on YouTube is that we're friends from high school, we've been talking about movies for like 15 years, and we're always going to be talking about movies. Also, we're not just on YouTube, we're on Apple Pod and Spotify and all the other places to get podcasts. So, uh, I'm Nick Moffat, I'm here with Derek Deal. Hello. Brandon Bowlby. How's it going? And Sean Bowlby. Hey there. So uh, this week is uh, pretty special. You know, <laughs> we're pretty excited about this uh, for a few different reasons. But the big reason is that it's our big top 10 end of the year. 2021 is over. It's our season finale. We're doing our best movies of the year list. And yeah, yeah, it's February. I get it. It's February. It's going to be March when this comes out. But, you know... I said it last month, but I'll say it again. We have our calendar just a little bit off so we can see all the movies. You know, we want our lists to be fair. We want them to represent the true identity of the year. And hey, some of the biggest movies just came out. Nomadland just came out on Hulu like last week. So, you know, you know, you know. Yeah, Agreed. Get off my back. <laughs> just kidding. And the Oscars don't start till April now. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think I'm hoping that's just this year. It's usually based around the Oscar calendar, but um, yeah, at least we're beating the Oscars. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. Screw you, Oscar. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we're doing our top 10. Really excited about it. We love doing this. I, as you can tell, I'm a little hyped up, but uh, before we get in, we do have a couple announcements going forward. So Brandon, Tell us what the first announcement is. We're changing up the podcast a little bit for season five coming up. We're going to be doing once a week episodes. These are going to be Tuesdays at 8 p.m. and streamed live to YouTube. Um, We're going to be switching it up a little bit more with doing only two people per episode, except for in special cases, there will possibly be three or four. But for the most part, you'll just see two of us at a time rotating in and out. Um, and it is only going to be one film per week that we'll be discussing, which means the episodes will probably be a little bit shorter. No longer these hour and 45 minute episodes, you'll get something more around maybe 30 minutes ish and we'll see how it goes. I hope you guys like it. And that'll start on this Tuesday. Yeah. So we're, we're going to get going. We're going to be on YouTube doing it live and then we'll be up on the podcast apps the next day. And yeah, we'll do a little bit of banter, but this will be an opportunity for us to focus more on specific movies, go a little more in depth on them and, uh, you know, still have a good time with it. So I guess the second thing isn't really an announcement, but more of um, the lay of the land of uh, the top 10 show. So the thing about our top 10 episode is that we take turns. uh, We start at the bottom. We start our number 10s and we uh, work our way to our number ones. Easy as that. The thing that uh, is a little bit different. uh, We took this from the top 10 movie show with John Roca and Matt Nost, but we do the punt technique. So if someone has it higher on their list, then... Uh, Then they yell out punt and we don't talk about it until it's the highest that could possibly go. So in theory, we talk about the, you know, our favorite movies at the end. The person that likes it the most will have the opportunity to talk about it first. And uh, that's that's just the the lay the 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 way the crookie crumbles. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I was looking for a goofy thing to say there and nothing came out. So, um Sean, uh, Sean's going to be taking notes, uh, not notes, but you're going to be keeping score. That's the other fun thing is that we're going to have a a score going. Uh, Sean, do you want to break down how we're keeping score? Yeah. uh, I also wanted to point out that we're all going into this blind. So we we have no idea what our other everyone else's lists are. So I'm going to be keeping track of the lists um, or at least everyone's rankings. And um, I'm going to be assigning point values to the rankings where uh, if someone has a movie at number 10, it's going to be th- that movie is going to get one point. And uh, nine is two points all the way up to one uh, first place is 10 points. There's also uh, one additional uh, point given to a movie if it appears on more than one list. So if it appears on two lists, it gets one extra point. If it appears, and if it if it appears on all four lists, it gets three extra points. So um, yeah, and at the very end, I will announce the monthly movie dispatches top ten ranking combined average 
ranking of the year 2020. Yeah, 2021. It's in the books. Uh, mm-hmm. our, we'll have our top 10 2021. Uh, then it'll go on Twitter and be official. Um, 2021, weird year. Weird year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if any of my movies I saw in theaters. I think that's a huge difference. Um, 2020? 2021, no, I mean. Yeah, like the 20, 2020. <laughs> it's 2021 right now. I'm sorry. 2021 is in the books. Not thinking clearly. But... Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was super it weird. Won the Oscar in n- 1978, so it came out in 19. Anyways, that old confusion. Yeah, that, right. that old confusion going on for decades. Games, yeah. Right. Anyway, let's jump into it. Uh, so, Derek, you're going first. What is your oh, yes. number number ten? Okay. Ooh, yes. <laughs> here uh, we just getting right into go. It. Well kick things off with an easy one for me uh my number 10 is uh christopher nolan's tenant um i know i think i know i loved i know i liked it way more than everyone else but uh yeah it's just hard for me to pass up on christopher nolan's creativity and his bombastic action is just like always a good time so Damn, I, Nick. I was wondering if that was on your list. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's on your list, Eric. I'm glad it's on your list. But yeah. no, it did, it did not make my list. Um, cool. Well, that was Derek's number 10, Tenet. Uh, Sean, what is your number 10? Oh, man. Um, my number 10 movie is uh, the movie Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Um, there was a... Uh, pretty big lack of uh fun this year i felt like and (laughs) it just um this movie just really stood out i saw it like three times um i had an absolute blast every time it wasn't um you know there's some some uh some things that weren't great about it uh i thought the the it was a little scattered and and uh had some pacing issues but overall it was one of the funnest movies i saw all year and uh i think that really stands out in 20 for 2020 and um, one of the only movies yeah, we all sure. got to see in theaters mm-hmm. this yeah. last year that was I the last movie it. i saw I in theaters it. oh you haven't seen it no. Derek. Oh, my yeah. God. oh that was the last movie i saw in theaters so uh It'll, it has a special place in my heart, even though I kind of hated it. Um, but you know, I don't mean to. I don't mean to rain on your parade. Uh, but you know, good for you. But uh, you know, yeah, we saw in theaters. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, okay. So I'm next. I'm next. My my number ten is. I'm wondering if there's a punt here. I'm so wondering if there's a punt here. <laughs> I, I struggle with my number ten. My number ten is in the vast of night, or the vast of night. Punt. Punt. Yes. For sure, punt. Yes. Okay. Did we explain punts at the beginning of the episode? I did. Yeah. yeah oh, did. okay. Yeah. All right. We'll punt. Okay. Okay. Um, Brandon, what is your number 10? It feels so weird saying this because everyone's going to punt it, especially when Birds of Prey <laughs> oh, and 10 no. were set at number 10. Um, <laughs> my number 10 is Sound of Metal. Punt. Wow. Punt. 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 Wow. Same thing, guys. Oh. Wow. What? <laughs> Wow, what what movies did you see this year? Jeez. Um, one thing I want, I'm sorry, real quick, can we put a time on this just really quick? <laughs> one thing I wanted to do that I totally spaced on because I didn't put in the show notes was that I wanted to say uh, who, like, how many movies did we actually see? Mm. You know, like what everyone's total is. Do you guys yeah, happen to have, to, do you have that you in front of you really real quick? quick? Yeah. yeah, I mean, do you mind, like, if we just take like a minute and just say real quick? Um, how many movies we saw, or we could do that at the end when Sean, Sean's tabulating. Oh, I don't care. I have either it. way. Whatever. Depends on if you guys have it right in front of you or not. I, I have it right. In front I have of it you. right in front of me. Okay. okay, Sean, how many did you see this year? Uh, I saw forty-two movies. Ooh, Derek. I saw no. forty-one movies. Okay, it's pretty close, Sean. Brandon. I don't have it yet. Okay, um, I saw. 103 <laughs> movies. <laughs> God. Well, you know, it's my goal every year to get to at least 100. Yeah. So uh, I think it was 103. Is Brandon counting on his hands <laughs> and toes? I, I watched the New Mutants this week. Did, 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 does that count as 2020? 2020? Yeah, I think so. Oh, no. Maybe one some of these movies. Then. I don't know if... Uh, 
the uh, news of the world counts as 2020 or 2021? I think it counts as 2020. All right. That's kind of one of those movies that's in the gray area. Yeah. The reason I questioned the new mutants was because uh, I just, even though I watched it, I'm still not totally sure it exists. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 51. Okay. 51 for Brandon. That was a really quick skim. Cool. Sorry I threw, put you on the spot like that. Were you counting? Bro. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have it in front of me. You don't have it on Letterboxd? Not in a list form. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Cool. Well, oh. um. All right. My turn. Number nine. Derek, you're number nine. My number nine. My number nine is Promising Young Woman. Bunt. Oh. Hunt. Cool. Okay. Um, Oh, Sean, what is your number nine? Um, Let me log that real quick for Derek. Keeping score. Two points. Uh, My number nine is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Oh, no punt. No punt. But I I just watched this one. Yeah. um, This movie is really fantastic it is so fast paced it's so sharp um it is it has a great score great great music soundtrack um and man uh, you know chadwick boseman um it, it's it's so sad that this was his last performance and um he nailed it he he hit it out of the park he's so good um uh, and then viola davis um is amazing as well as she always is, but um, just some all around incredible performances, great message, um, has a, a lot to say. Um, it's it's one of the better um, overall of these kinds of Broadway productions um, brought to screen, like very contained, um, kind of the um, focused, you know, very dialogue focused, driven. dialogue driven type stories. Uh, movies that I've seen and it's just it's really good uh, abs- absolutely fantastic it's, it's pretty short too it's like I think just over 90 minutes and um, yeah it's just um, really good movie yeah I mean Chadwick Boseman I mean yeah. really like I mean it was kind of like a Heath Ledger situation where like mm-hmm. he really oh, yeah, was totally. like that might be his best best performance I mean mm-hmm. we know he's a great actor Black Panther and all that but like yeah like he like he was like unrecognizable in this movie yeah you know he was one of those like shapeshifters mm-hmm. and uh, you know, his face looked different. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, my number nine is the five bloods. Um, Spike Lee's newest movie. That, yeah. It was Spike Lee's newest movie. It was on Netflix. Um, great performances, uh, Vietnam war setting, uh, flashbacks. These Vietnam veterans went back to Vietnam, uh, looking for, for treasure and kind of dealing with the post traumatic stress of it all. And, um, there was a lot of great themes and I know the movie was kind of a mess. It was all over the place tonally, but, um, you know, I, I just felt like Spike Lee was like really doing his thing. You know, he was, uh, in the mud and really grinding it out. And, um, yeah, I thought this was a really powerful movie. Um, and Isn't Chadwick yeah. Boseman in that movie, too? Chadwick yeah. Boseman is in that movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so uh, he was kind of small, smaller role in it, but kind of weird, though, because he he was their friend who had passed away in during the war. So they went mm-hmm. back and they were like mourning him the whole movie. So it was kind of weird watching that around the same really? time that he actually passed away. It was mm-hmm. kind of yeah. just kind of weird that way. But yeah. Um, Either way, uh, the movie I thought was was pretty powerful. So uh, that's the Five Bloods. Um, it's on Netflix. So Brandon, what is your number nine? My number nine is a movie I don't think anybody here saw. Um, it is called Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets. Uh, this is an extremely bizarre experimental film. Um, not in what you're necessarily seeing on the screen, but in the way it was created. It is blurring the lines between documentary and live action, even though it's all technically live action. Um, but similar to like No Man Land and Rider, it's like you are watching real people act out these scenes in the dingiest dive bar in the back corner of Las Vegas Strip. 
And um, all it is is one night on New Year's Eve seeing these human, absolutely blunk, blacked out drunk interactions for an entire film worth. Were they actually blacked um, out drunk? Well, I too. imagine that's how they got this to actually work is <laughs> the funny. actors were blacked out for <laughs> days on end as they were shooting this film <laughs> because it is quite an experience. And I don't know necessarily how much I enjoyed it while it was happening, but by the time it all wrapped up and concluded, I respected the hell out of it. So yeah. that's Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets. That's on Netflix. Wow. Yes. Brandon, I seriously yeah. thought that was a documentary. Like I hadn't seen it and I really thought I it was thought a documentary. It was, yeah. so. I swear, I actually, I used Brandon's, um, you know, diary, letterbox diary to make the, the chart that I made. And, uh, I saw that on there and I saw it as a documentary. Letterbox calls and it. A maybe it is a documentary, but it's, it's, yeah. I yeah. Well, so I'm sure it's super weird. I mean, like <laughs> Las Vegas, Las Vegas on New Year's, like. There's one point oh where you boy. see the cameraman. It's it's really weird. Okay, <laughs> sounds like I mean, a documentary. I mean, I, you're making me want to watch it though. I mean, I, I I did not really know anything about it except for like, I don't know. I heard little bits, and you're making me, you know, I should I should seek that out. So, um, cool. So, uh, can you repeat the name of it one more time? Bloody nose, empty pockets. Okay, cool. So that was brand's number nine. Derek, what is your number eight? My number eight expecting punts here is first cow punt for sure yeah okay all right uh sean what is your number eight uh one second for derek three first cow three points my number eight is uh the movie palm springs punt yes wow (laughs) Talk about fun so movie. Cool. Yeah, yeah um, totally. Is a really so, fun uh, Brian, my number eight, my number eight is, um, maybe we'll get another punt here. My number eight is Nomad Land. Punt. Okay. Cool. Um, Derek, background to you. Here we oh, go. Back Brandon. to me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Brandon. That was a quick <laughs> round, guys. All right. My number eight is The Nest. All right. So when looking over my list, actually, this is like, to me, really the only drama somehow on here, possibly. Um, And I love a good drama, like full on drama, Mm. as you guys know. And I think it hardly gets any better than this. The acting and performances are spot on. Um, The subtle writing and character development is incredible throughout the whole thing. And it is like gorgeous sight to behold at every moment. Um, and I loved seeing these characters develop. So The Nest was one of my favorite movies of the year. It's a really good movie. Spot on. I just wish it was called something else. <laughs> just Such kidding. a bad name. <laughs> Such a forgettable name. I always forget the name of them. I was texting you guys about it today. I was like, that Jude Law movie with the house. <sighs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> the Nest. Um, okay, great, great pick, Brandon. I'm glad uh, you had it on there. Uh, totally, totally makes sense for you. Um, I'm surprised no one else had it on there. But um, back to Derek, where that was a quick round. Wow. Okay, um, almost all punts. So now we're at our number sevens. So Derek, what is your number seven? My number seven is. I'm thinking of ending things. Ooh, punt, punt. Okay, cool. <laughs> that goes to Sean now. Sean, what is your number oh, seven? Oh, no. I'm, I'm already oh, no. getting behind here. Don't no, um, worry about that. Do your number seven. Okay. We'll help you. All right. My number seven uh, movie is... We are blowing through these right now. Uh, my number seven is His House. Ooh. His That's house. You see this, right? This is one you wanted to watch at the last minute. I... Um, Man, I watched this movie up at my... So I've been staying up at my parents' house in their trailer pretty frequently this year. And I went up there, stayed in their trailer. It's in the middle of the woods. In the middle of the night, I think I started it at 1130, pitch black, by myself, completely alone, dead silent. And it was terrifying. (laughs) I I legitimately had to sleep with a nightlight on like a baby (laughs) and uh yeah it's uh 
it really, really worked on me. Um, what more do you need from a horror movie? Yeah, exactly. Just I mean, the light on that night. And you don't need anything more from a horror movie, but this movie delivers even more. It has a lot to say. It's uh, it's a really interesting premise. The monster is super interesting. Um, yeah, the set design and um, yeah, the, the kind of its conclusion, how it how it all comes together in the end is is really impactful, um, really meaningful. Uh, all around fantastic horror movie. It's everything, kind of everything I'm looking for in a horror film. Yeah, that's on I'm Netflix that. too. Right? Do you yeah. guys saw it, Nick and Derek? I, the horror seen experts? It yet. I haven't. I saw it, it and yeah, I'm, 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 I, I'm sorry I didn't make my top ten. Definitely my top twenty, probably top fifteen. But yeah, it's uh, one of those movies where like, uh, yeah, the horror is fantastic. The the set. I'm glad you mentioned the set because like what they do with the walls in that movie is super crazy. But um, I, it's one of those horror movies that uh, uses the monster, or the ghost as a vehicle for something else, trauma, past, past demons, you know, those sort of things. And it's also about an, a culture that you don't usually uh, get movies about. So, um, yeah, uh, good pick, Sean. I'm really glad you saw it. Looking back on the year, it's kind of like, oh, too bad we didn't talk about that, like on the podcast, because that would have been a cool one for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Seen. Um. So yeah, that was uh, his house, and that was Sean's number seven. My number seven is the sound of metal. Punt. 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 Okay. Cool. So let's go to our number sixes. Um, well, Brandon can say his number seven. <laughs> You've done that a few times to me, Nick. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I, I think I'm just used to going last or something. So yeah, okay. Usually you do. My number seven is Nomadland. And oh. Nick, you also had this on your list, right? One before. Yes, I had okay. it right before. Nick, what was it? What number was it, Nick? Mine was number eight, so that would have okay. been three points. Yeah this this film is gorgeous. And sad, yet hopeful. Um, It is a tone poem, as people like to say. Um, It's hard to even describe it as a drama because there's not really too much drama that even happens. You're just living with Frances McDormand in her nomadic lifestyle that's happened to her. Um, This movie really makes you think about life and love and death and all the big questions. And it does it really, really well. Um, it is also beautiful, um, taking place in like the Midwest and seeing this lead character go on her nomadic adventure through America. And I just think it's an overall incredible, remarkable film. Yeah. I, I second that. Obviously I had in my top 10, uh, kind of bummed the rest of you guys didn't <laughs> let's do with that. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, Brandon, I want to uh, second what you said about the lack of drama. You know, I'm I'm very much into movies where the drama happens like before the movie starts. You know, she she lost her husband and her town before the movie even starts. And then the whole movie is just kind of just following her around as she's uh, surviving in her van. And, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of drama like, you know, explicitly, but there is a lot of um struggle there's a lot of um beautiful beautiful landscapes but yeah it's mostly just like a meditation on what your what your life is and who you want to be and how how to live um you know with, like one with nature but also like finding community and there's all sorts of themes to think about while you're watching it and uh super great performance by Franz McDermott um you know, uh, I feel like we need to shout out the director, um, Chloe Zhao, I think is mm-hmm. her name. Yep. And, uh, you know, she, uh, she really directed the heck out of this movie. Um, she also did the writer, uh, young, years back. insanely promising director. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think she's going to be a shoe in for, um, a best directing, uh, nomination this year. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really mm-hmm. ready to root for her to win. Just uh, mm-hmm. yeah, she, I, yeah, I agree. She's uh, something else, and I'd like to see what else she has in store for us in the coming years. So um, the immortals, 
That's yeah, she is. Her next movie awesome. is a Marvel movie. So <laughs> she went from doing these two super indies where there's like no actors in the movies yeah. to doing a, a Marvel movie, which is great. So God. so excited. <laughs> um, anyway, so is yeah, Brandon not excited for that? No, I want her to make another Nomadland, but that's my number seven. Who's to say? Maybe the Immortals will be just her next. No, just just be superheroes wandering around desolate landscapes, contemplating, interacting with real aliens. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, um, we're we're done with this round. (laughs) We're our number sixes. Yeah. Number sixes. So Derek. Anyway, yeah. Go ahead. I I can tell you my number. My number. Uh, seven was the sound of metal. If right. That's uh, okay. what you're looking for. Yep. My number uh, six, I'm not expecting anyone else to have this on their list, but uh, it, it really, really stuck with me throughout the whole year was Relic. Um, this was one of the first movies I think we reviewed this year. It was like one of the first episodes. Or maybe it was just right after quarantine happened, so it just felt like that was the beginning of the year. But um, I think it was like we took a break from new movies for a yeah. few months. I think it was one of our first mm-hmm. like coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like really, really love this movie. I thought like, um, you know, what they were going through for with their very, I mean, in your face, like kind of metaphor stuff, actually really worked for me, and um, it was genuinely scary had some really good scary moments um especially with the like claustrophobic scenes in that movie or like really make my skin crawl but um it's also like a cool example of how you can tell like a really really deeply personal story like through horror Um, because a lot of times people just like be flashy and stuff like that but um yeah and it's really kind of a sweet bittersweet kind of movie so yeah definitely absolutely I, if like i had house where there's yeah, like i was gonna confusing. say if i it is possible that if i had seen them kind of opposite where uh, i i saw relic in my parents trailer all by myself i may have could have possibly swapped those two movies but yeah another really really good horror film yeah definitely <clears throat> Using horror as a vehicle to tell uh, an important story. Mm -hmm. That's very personal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Good pick. Uh, Good pick. I'm glad it's on here. Um, So, Sean, what is your number six? My number six is... I'm thinking of ending things. Punt. Punt. (laughs) Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Um, my number six is um, Soul. Nobody? Punt. Yes. Yeah. Getting jacked up about puns these days. Uh-huh. Um, They're so exciting. Um, Brandon, my, uh, what is your number six? My number nine? six film is Possessor. Oh. How dare you guys? Wow. How fucking dare you? <laughs> I, I had a feeling we were getting like too high on the list for it to show up, but I, oh my God, <laughs> this movie is so good. It's, guys. it's really, really good. It's really good. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, t- like, I guess it's not full on horror, body horror. Brandon Cronenberg directed the hell out of this horror film. Um, I'm so down for like a great polished sci-fi film and it has those, smart, intelligent world building elements to it. Um, along with just a really like fucked up trippy, uh, ladder section of the film. Uh, this is a brilliant movie with amazing visuals from just looking at the poster to what actually happens on screen. Yeah. I, I'm shocked. None of you guys picked this, but yeah, <laughs> possessor all around incredible, incredible film. I mean, if my list was based on like, like actual like measurable quality of like a film i think that movie would be further up as opposed to like my favorite films of the year kind of thing so yeah i i do i will say i I feel like this mo- this good. year more than other years i'm like it's it's more of my personal list how i was feeling at the time how 
yeah what i what i enjoyed more <laughs> how how it impacted me while i watched the movie yeah i just mean this year. I, I hear you on that I, like i kind of feel like i did the same thing a little bit too where yeah. uh like i i was trying to be like honest with myself of like mm-hmm. These are the movies that like I know I loved and I, yeah. I was looking back for a few years back um, at some of the picks I, I I've done in the past. And I I was try- I, I, I noticed a pattern of me picking movies that I was like supposed to pick, you know, because they were the good movies of that year. But like I haven't rewatched them since. So mm-hmm. I was kind of like trying to be honest with like I would I'm going to see this one like, you know a bunch mm. more in my life it should be higher on my list and stuff but yeah that's nothing to do no with possessor, the possessor though. twice <laughs> yeah, yeah no uh, you know I, I had issues with that yeah. movie anyway but i i am yeah. glad that you had it on here and mm. uh because it was yeah. like it was a big movie this year and like cronenberg was doing something mm. yeah you know, i'm hoping sure. he follows in his dad's footsteps because uh you know i hope he makes you know i hope he makes movies for 20 more years mm. and you know yeah. i can see where he really goes with this whole thing yeah um so that was Possessor, and that was Brandon's number six. So, Derek, we're back around to you, our top fives. Top yes. fives. So my top five is, or my number five uh, is Soul. Uh, Nick's number six, is that what it was? Yeah, I just yeah. had a number six. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like Pixar uh, putting out like top tier Pixar movies again. And, uh, this one just really, you know, it does like the typical Pixar or not typical, but like you see this a lot in animation where it's like they, they, there's a gimmick there that they kind of go with to appeal to different audiences as stuff. But I think this movie just like nailed it all the way through. And, um, yeah, it was really, really fun, cute, visually stunning. Uh, deep I mean, heartfelt movie. Yeah. I, yeah, I love this movie. Um, I, I wish it was higher. You know, this is one of those movies where like I kind of, I had it just slightly lower than I really wanted to have it just because I do think like there's something, there's something off about the plot, like the plotting of this mm-hmm. movie. I feel like it kind of flows in kind of a off sort of way, just a little bit, but a jazzy kind of way. But like I do, I, so I real quick, I had I had surgery last week. I was up on the couch for like, you know, five days, couldn't move. I rewatched a bunch of movies and this is one of the first ones I rewatched. And I was like, I definitely was going in and out. I was like falling asleep and waking back up. But I just kept waking up and being like, oh, these visuals are incredible. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They really <laughs> captured something here. This is like this is like a dream. This is this is. <laughs> This is this is meaningful. And then uh, the themes, you know, the whole movie is about like purpose and uh, why you're on this world and what what is the purpose of living? You know, these huge themes. And this is hardly a kid's movie. This is to me absolutely a movie for adults. (laughs) And um, again, why I said like last episode, like the last round, like this is a movie I think I'm going to watch like a lot in my life. And I I think I'm, I think those plotting issues are going to kind of go away, um, after I see it more. And, um, I think I'm just gonna like have a great time, like just, just, just being in the afterlife or the pre-life that they've created, uh, in this movie. There's just so much going on and, uh, yeah, I just love the zone that they created, um, for passions and, mm. um, just, just such a fantastic concept that they, they really, um, knocked out of the park. So, um, yeah, that was soul. It was Derek's number five and my number six. So Sean, uh, back to you. Hey there. Um, number my number, my number five is, uh, worth six points. My brain is going back and forth. Uh, is Wolf Walkers? Mm. Oh, oh man, I'm surprised. Um, <laughs> oh man, uh, this movie is so good. Um, yeah, talk about visuals. Uh, <clears throat> what's his? Name? Tom? Oh no, I'm blanking on his name. Um, oh, you know. Tom. T- uh, um. Tom Moore. Uh, is an incredible filmmaker, uh, an incredible v- visual storyteller. Um, 
he and he, he has uh, just the most interesting subject matter and uh, the way he tells kind of um, folk tales and um, myth, you know, the way he deals with mythology and um, kind of his own uh, Irish culture is is beautiful and um, super interesting and emotional and de- incredibly deep. Um, and yeah, it's just a, another in a long line of fantastic movies by him. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an incredibly emotional um, ride. Um, and yeah, we just I absolutely love the movie. Can't I want to say, say one of the tightest scripts it. you could possibly get. Yeah. Just all the way through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not even that. It, it's a, as far as... Um, yeah, it's 103 minutes as far as uh, animated movies go. It's not not that not super short. So, yeah. Brandon, was this close to being on your list? I, 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 I loved it. Yeah, it was. It would be in my top 20 or top 15. Yeah, yeah. incredibly well paced movie. Everything pays off. Everything comes back around in a perfect way. It is such a good, well written animated film. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think I just kind of forgot about this. I don't think it would have been my top 10, but I think I just like, oh, yeah, Wolfwalkers. Oh, great animation. <laughs> Holy moly. So great pick. Yeah, it was Sean. even on that sight and sound list I linked to you, and I was I forgot it was on there, too, totally. on top 20. Totally. So um, that was Sean's uh, number number five. I Yeah, I feel like this is like, the, I mean, I feel like this might be the round where like just – we're like in a weird space in our list where there's like these movies that are pretty high on our list that no one else has seen. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of a funny thing. This is like my next pick is one of those where I'm, I don't know if it's going to be on anyone's list, but I'm going to be psyched if it is, but I don't think it's going to be. Anyway, my number five is um, The Invisible Man. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I have a really up there. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I rewatched this movie, uh, not while I was uh, recovering from surgery, but I rewatched it and I was just totally blown away. Uh, it cemented, um, what I thought of this movie. Like I saw in theaters and I was really wrapped up in the drama and the, the fright of it because I think it's a extremely effective horror movie. Like it's, it, it works on a few different levels of, of horror and it's like takes the classic monster movie trope of the invisible man. And it really, um, it uses that as a platform, like a jumping off point to, um, actually tell a story. That's not really, um, that's more about like, uh, toxic relationships and abusive relationships and what, like the psychological aspect of that, you know, I think this movie, um, you know, is, is paced and, um, built like a slasher movie, like a classic slasher movie, but really it's, it's more psychological than anything else. The movie is about Elizabeth Moss inside her head and questioning everything of whether or not this person is real or not. And she's losing her mind every second the movie goes on and it's draining and it's gauzing her, She's going crazy over it. And uh, the cinematography of this movie is just brilliant because it's it makes you think that there's people. It makes you question everything that's in an empty room. You know, the camera just lingers, which, by the way, is like my new favorite thing of uh, 2020. It was just I I just want a camera to linger, you know, uh, (laughs) and and uh, you just you're just like, is, is, is he in there? Is, and she's like looking at a chair and you're like, <laughs> he's probably in that chair, but you know, <laughs> no idea. And, um, it, it's just, to me, it's like extremely effective as, uh, as a horror movie and as a, um, psychological inquiry of abusive relationships. It's just to me, extremely powerful. And, uh, yeah, I loved it. And I, I'm just so psyched that they made this movie. Yeah. So it's, um, it's so good. And like, uh, sorry, I just want to gush for just a second, just cause Lee Winnell, like he's becoming one of my favorite directors, just like his, whatever it is, just the light, like look that he gives to like the camera or like whatever he does that makes it, I don't like, he just shoots movies just slightly a little 
in his style to where it's like, I don't know. I just love his aesthetic, like whatever that is that he brings to him. Like I really, really like between both of these and upgrade, like just the look of both of them are. That's like exactly. I'm so excited to see tons more of that. His movies are like really gritty, but also very smooth or yeah. something, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. they're really clean, but also gritty somehow. But yeah. he just does like weird camera angles, too. It's just like like the camera like follows people like sideways and like, mm-hmm. as they fall over. Like, yeah. What you know, what like, other directors kind of make like really cheesy, um, do really cheesy shots uh, following action? He's like. Somehow he does it and he pulls it off really well and it, yeah. it's really creative and, and interesting. Yeah. Fun fact, his house, uh, Relic, Possessor, Invisible Man. We each picked a horror movie and none of them oh, overlapped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. Hmm. That's oh. true. One for each of our lists. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had the vast in there too. I think that's a horror movie, but uh, the had a punt. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that'll come back around, hopefully. Um, hopefully. Hopefully um, we get around <laughs> to that punt. Um, okay, <laughs> so, uh, Brandon, what is your number five? My number five is Kajillionaire. Punt. Oh, whoa! I knew Derek would. <laughs> he loved it. All right. Look at him. He loved okay. it. <laughs> so we are, uh, we are going into our top fours then. Okay. So, Derek, what is your number five? Oh, Four. My number four is Weathering With You. That was my number four as well. Nice. Wow. Our first, <laughs> our first, uh, damn, Derek. Duality. <laughs> and um, it's a little controversial, too. Who knows when this yeah, movie actually this came out? It's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> but we didn't have access to it until September, I believe, of 2020. Um, yeah, but uh, I just really, really loved it. It was like a, such a unique story um, told with, you know, beautiful animation again. It was just like a nice, it was really like, I really like the tone that they were able to hit with it where it's kind of, you know, it feels really light and fluffy the whole time. It's so colorful and like bubbly and stuff. But, um, you know, it's just dealing with these, issues that these teenagers are going through. I guess it's really kind of a coming of age story when I think about it, but yeah, um, definitely um, just with a, a really unique fun twist on it. And um, yeah, big fan. I think you forgot to really mention, like I guess the big thing is uh, this is a anime Japanese film with oh, the yeah. acclaimed director who did your name, which is one of the biggest films yeah. that came out of Japan um, four years ago or so. Um, yeah, I loved this movie too. This is also my number four. Uh, it's an incredible coming of age film with a really interesting sci-fi, like wrapped in a little sci-fi concept that with a little bit of fantasy, a little fantasy, a little, yeah, more fantasy than sci-fi. Um, really cool world building in that concept as well. Um, I loved the music and the sound oh, yeah, design, and so this good. just has one of the most explosive climaxes that just gets my heart racing. Yeah. Um, and also you can't just like your name. You can't say enough about the animation and visuals. Yeah. Cool. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So that was weathering with you. Um, that was Derek's number four. Um, and Brandon's so sh- number four. And Brandon's number four. Uh, so Sean, what is your number four? My number four movie is uh, Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. Wow. Um, This was... When did we see this movie? We we reviewed it on the podcast, but um, this was the first movie that made me go, wow, this year. Um, It was an emotional roller coaster, um, yet super subtle. Um incredible performances yet very subdued um it had so much to say uh it, it was an extremely important story uh that i think yeah it's a story that people should see um and it's just it's 
it uh, it knows what it's doing. It, it knows what it's saying. It has something to say. It knows what it's saying, and it it says it so powerfully, um, and so concisely. And uh, it, it's really it, and I loved how it's such a focused movie, um, and so specific. You know, it's saying these very broad things, yet through a very narrow window. Just one person. It's about one person. This one experience. This one maybe weekend. Um, f- three or four days that she spends in the city, um, and it, it it's extremely powerful. the The relationships are are heartwarming and um, true and honest, um, and it's it worked extremely well for me. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, definitely, definitely my number four. Great pick, Sean. Hit that, uh, it hit that number really hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That was one for me where, like, I kind of, like, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was a great movie. But that was one for me where I felt like it was just, it didn't hit for 2020 because it was so serious. You mm-hmm. know, like what you were saying earlier where, it, like, mm-hmm. yeah. some, I don't know. I just. The possessor effect. Yeah. Yeah. Possessor was a little different for me. I mean, yeah, it was not quite. Possessor like <laughs> actively made me angry and upset at the end. This movie, I was just like, oh, that was good. That was good. But it was also like, you know, about abortion. So I was just like, oh, I don't really want to think too much about that right now in the middle of a pandemic. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, it was, it was tough. But great, great movie. Great movie, Sean. So that brings me to my number four. Um and if I am calculating it correctly, it's definitely going to be a punt. And that's, Three. I'm thinking of ending things. Punt. Cool. So now we're going on to our number threes. Good. I'm psyched that that was a punt. I knew it was going to be, though. That's why I didn't have a huge reaction. But um, so, Derek, what is your number three? My number three, and I wasn't sure how we were handling these. I don't know if everyone else is handling them different. That's the big question. I don't know what you're talking about. My number three is Small Axe Mangrove. Punt? (laughs) With a question mark, probably. (laughs) Sean, you got to say something. (laughs) I don't know if we... Yeah. Yeah. Punt. Yeah. Punt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, Sean, what is your number three? You guys, I'm so far behind. <laughs> we'll help you. Going, yeah. We, we can um, do catch up. Yeah, like. take, a, take a peek. Take a peek when you can. Uh, <laughs> number three. My number three is Promising Young Woman. Damn. Nice. Punt from nice. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Who was, was it? My number nine. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is a good movie. Uh, it's extremely entertaining, thrilling um, with, with a tinge of mystery and, um, uh, it's really well paced. It's a really interesting story. Um, Carrie Mulligan gives a, gives a really great performance and, um, it's, I feel like I'm (laughs) probably going to say some very similar things for, uh, never rarely, sometimes always. It's a, it's a incredibly meaningful movie. It's a it's a powerful movie. Uh, it has a lot to say. It's an it's a very stylized movie. It has a lot of style, great look, um, a lot of color, um, and it is. There are some truly shocking moments in this movie. Um, you know, it, it's it's a movie that is impossible to predict where it's going to end up um, from where it starts. Um, and it takes you in directions you aren't expecting. Um, it it says things that you aren't expecting. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a really powerful movie. Um, you can, I mean, you can write an essay on this film. It's uh, very... Uh, it's very intentional. I, I feel like everything what that um, that she put into this movie was really well thought out. Every aspect is is so detailed, and 
um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name. Emerald Maybe Fennel. That. Emerald Fennel. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I think nothing in this movie is an accident or at least the, the, that's the, the vibe that the movie puts out. It's everything is intentional. Everything is well thought out. Um, every decision is, is meaningful and, um, powerful and yeah, uh, really, really good movie, um, that has sparked a lot of conversation, um, since I've seen it. So I think this might be like the most recommendable movie that I saw this year outside of like maybe Palm Springs, like just cause I think it's like, if you like movies, I don't know anyone that wouldn't like this movie cause it has everything. Like it's super like sucks you in so quickly at the beginning with like, it's awesome visuals and like really like catchy music, you know, and you're, mm. it's like a cool setting and, and it has like just one of those endings where you're just like, good God, like, holy crap. This movie's awesome. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it like drove home a point. Like it was like bold and it and it just like wrapped it up like nicely. And yeah, it's such an easy movie for me to recommend people. So Yeah. I'm really glad you guys had it on your list. And Sean, I'm glad you had it so high. I I I think for me this was just like a matter of timing a little bit. Like I don't know. I, I loved it. Like I was one that picked this movie and I, I, I only had positive things to say about it, but I think I got kind of, I think I overthought it a little bit. And, um, I read, a, I don't know. I read a lot. I read a lot about this movie. And I, I think if I had like more, if I had time for a rewatch with this one, I think I would have probably had it higher. Um, because yeah, I mean, you guys are, you guys are totally right. Just hearing you guys talk about this movie makes me go like, oh, yeah, that, that was like everything you said about her vision. Like this was such a like she had an idea and she conceptualized it and made it a reality. And it was, um, you know, it's the kind of movie I want. I want more of. I want more movies like this. So um, great pick. Great movie. Um, I'm glad you guys had it so so high on your list. Um, okay. So where are we at? My, my number number three, three, my number three is Palm Springs. Damn. Damn. (laughs) I, yeah, I had it at, uh, uh Oh, sorry. I had it at, uh, like eight, I think. Yeah. So, um, again, I, uh, here's a recurring theme. Like I rewatched Palm Springs. Uh, I've, I've seen it three times this year. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep watching it. I'm going to watch this movie so many times in my lifetime. This is like, I love this movie so much. And like, honestly, it was a contender for number one. And, uh, it just didn't make it all the way there. But I, I think this movie, honestly, I think this movie has like, uh, to me, it's one of those movies that, people don't give enough credit because of how, how it's a comedy and how it um, it's a gimmick too. I think those two things are really working against the overall perception of this movie Um, because yeah, people, in my opinion, people don't take comedies seriously. I mean, they're comedies. So yeah, you're supposed to be laughing at them and stuff, but I really do think this movie had something to say. I think both characters are actually pretty subtle like, I think they're both doing pretty subtle performances and uh, rewatching it. You get to, like, see all the little little Easter eggs and little, like, things that are happening in the background and the small details that are happening over and over again. And, oh, my goodness, Andy Samberg just makes me laugh so hard in this movie. Like, there are just these scenes where he is just, like, absolutely killing it. And it just it just makes me laugh so hard. And honestly, this is like the this to me was the quarantine movie. Like this to Mm. me was the movie where you're, you know, we saw it in the middle of the summer when most of us were just doing the same thing every (laughs) single day. And that's what happens in this movie. Yeah. We're hunkered down. We're doing the same thing every day. And this movie just came out at the perfect time and was so funny. It was like the movie I needed. And Mm -hmm. I still use it for that. Like I told you, I rewatched it recently and I was having a pretty bad night. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to turn on Palm Springs. And then my whole night turned around. I ended up staying up way too late, watched the whole thing. And, um, yeah, you know, uh, and also I got, I got to admit, I am a sucker for, um, this concept, you know, the groundhog day every day is the same sort of concept. Um, obviously, I mean, you guys know how much I like happy death day, especially happy death day to you. But, um, (laughs) I do think this one did, um, this one did, it added to the gimmick, you know, and that, that's why I think that, you know, 
just brushing it aside as like, oh, it's another Groundhog Day movie. I don't think is fair because um, it's a totally different experience when there's two people that are living this gimmick, living that experience together. Mm -hmm. And the way they approach what the experience is, is really interesting. And uh, how they deal with it is pretty fascinating. And um, there's, there is like some sadness to both of these people that are living this experience. And not, not just because of, you know, the tragedy of, you know, being stuck in the same day over and over again, but both of them are like pretty sad people. And uh, again, it's kind of like about finding purpose in life. And, mm. uh, and that was like, again, a quarantine thing where like, you know, it's in my opinion, it's kind of like we're all going to be anxious and upset because of quarantine, because that, you know, it was a, it was a frustrating, you know, it, it's it was a weird year. And but uh, I, I don't know, I kind of I'm of the belief that, like, you know, it's up to you to, like, find a hobby or find some way, some passion, some interest to occupy your time to make that make that time worthwhile. And, you know, you you could pick up knitting or something. You do it every day during quarantine. All of a sudden, you know, three months later, you're going to be an expert at that thing. You know, so I, I think like they had little aspects of that in this movie, too, or some of the conclusion was was based mm-hmm. around that kind of idea as well. But, you know, it's um, I don't know. I just really this movie just really hit me and I, I, I just love it. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like um, to what you said about the the concept, it's what this movie does that a lot of other movies haven't done that I've seen um, is it's like, yeah, but really, what would it be like? What would it really how would this really play out this concept? And I feel like, you know, that's that's exactly what it, if you if someone brought you into this world and, you know, into this cycle, this reoccurring cycle and you were kind of unhinged by it you could just go kill them and any day, any There's day, no repercussions. as many times as you want, <laughs> no repercussions. And, uh, you could let out all your frustration over and over and over. And you might go do that if you were that kind of person. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like, um, that's just a really great take on it. Like, as opposed to all these much more high concept takes on the, on the, the, um, the Groundhog Day concept. Uh, yeah, I, I love that kind of slight shift in approach to this movie. And it, I just echo everything you said. It's it's a fantastic movie. It's so fun. I've seen it several times. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I think I might I think I might go turn it on after we're done here. Uh, just, just talking about it makes You're me go like it to yourself again. <laughs> yeah, no, just talking yeah. about it makes me go like, oh man, maybe I should have had it my number one. Can yeah. I can I can I change that right now? No, it's fine. I, I mean, I'll definitely, list, there's but. been a, I, I feel like that's what this year has been missing is like a distinct lack of fun because um, like all the big fun movies those those were the ones that got pushed and we we're kind of left with a lot of dramas and I mean, great, stay in front of your mic, Sean. Your voice changes so much when you do that. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but yeah. Um, anyways, yeah. I, that's, I, this was a fantastic movie. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you Stand had it on there, Sean. For the year. Um, so that was my number three. So, Brandon, what is your number three? All right. This is a very recent film I saw. It's called The Vast of Night. Woo! Nick had this on his list, too. What number, Nick? It was my number 10. This was a really early movie that came out this year, mm-hmm. and I was very, last year, I was very late to the party on this one, um, but I was glad I went to check it out. Um, this movie, to me, is like stylized masterpiece to the max, like turned up to 11. Every moment, every scene is like so purposeful and so well thought out of just how we can pack as much creativity and uniqueness into what we're going to show you. Um, The takes are long. They're complicated. The the scenes dry out. Um, I'm also like so on board for the ride. Like this movie was intense and fun for me. I was like constantly wondering what was going to happen next with this like sci-fi mystery. And I loved it. Um, With this like epic Close Encounters ending i don't know what people's gripes were i loved it and um yeah i i couldn't believe i was so late to seeing this movie 
Yeah, Brandon, I saw this movie. Yeah, when it was an Amazon Prime original, so it just mm-hmm. like popped up on Prime and it was getting good buzz. Yeah, so I saw it like pretty quick. I went, I saw it like in April or something, like middle of quarantine, and um. Yeah, I was pretty like shook by it. Like it, it was one of those movies I watched late at night, and um, it was like giving me just the heebie-jeebies. Like I just was like, yeah, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to really do anything. I, I I'm pretty scared to look out the window. Um, but I, I just want to echo what you said. Um, I agree. The the it was super unique, and there was a lot of um skill and um thought into everything that happened in the movie. I think the director, Andrew Patterson, it was his first movie. I'm really eager to see what else he does uh, in his career. Um, I think he's, I think it was one of those movies where it's like, yeah, that movie was directed. Mm -hmm. That movie was directed. He has a vision for sure. And um, I, I just want to say like, I really, I really appreciated the, the set, the the setting of the movie. You know, it was, um, I think it was like the fifties in a small town, maybe even earlier than the fifties, but it was a small fifties. Okay. And it was was a small town and the whole town is at the local basketball game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it just followed, but most of the movie is about the, the radio DJ and, uh, and him like doing his radio show. And then, um, this younger girl who's a, she works as a telephone operator. And so she's, constantly flicking the the panels not the panels the, the switches switchboard. you know mm-hmm. yeah the switchboard yeah. she's a switchboard operator and but she's like taking calls and then there's this mystery thing that's happening outside in the sky and it's it's pretty scary you know it's like the the tension builds and um you know it's it's like you know something about aliens like i have to I have to admit like this movie kind of opened a door for me with like aliens and ufo's and stuff it just kind of like made me interested you know and i watched this and then i watched this other movie uh fire in the sky that's oh uh, yeah i've seen not it. a great movie but like also <laughs> kind of is like i don't know it's kind of some of the scariest alien abduction in Holy that movie shit dude the alien <laughs> abduction in that movie is so fucked up but like most of the movie it's like realistic it's like the acting is really bad but you're like yeah but they're kind of real people they're just weirdo idiots yeah. and then the and then the bad stuff anyway i don't need to talk about that movie. <laughs> between those two movies i saw them pretty close yeah. together and then now i'm like now i'm like yeah now i'm always looking for ufos and i'm just it's like it opened a door in my mind but that uh, movie was made for seven hundred thousand dollars too wow not that's surprised right. yeah there's some expensive looking shots in that yeah. movie. Yeah. No That's excuses. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah exactly. I mean, Jesus, like they, they made an entire town look period. Yeah, How do yeah. you, uh, that's, a, that's really impressive. Yeah. They'd have that's to awesome. assume that there's a town like that, that exists in the Midwest somewhere or something. That's just, yeah. But like so all the car, they, it's like shots that fill a parking lot. From, I don't know. Maybe it's just CG. Maybe CG, it's just yeah. fairly a lot cheaper than I'm thinking it would be, but. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So great pick, Brandon. I'm so yep. psyched. Yeah. You got so high. I mean, I, that's awesome. I absolutely love the movie too. Yeah, it was really um, good. Yeah. Just in a couple, couple areas, it fell a little short. I don't even really have anything bad to say about it. It's just, yeah. I mean, we all have movies on this list that are yeah. just like that where, yep. you know, some are higher than others and that's just okay. But, um, I'm psyched that you had so high brand number three. Wow. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're into our number twos. Oh, shit. Okay, so Derek, Getting what serious. is your number... It's serious now. <laughs> what is your number two? My number two is Sound of Metal. Um, yep, me too. Wow. Duality. Yep. <laughs> this, yeah, I mean, we just reviewed it like on our last episode, I think. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so we, we've already talked a lot about it, but it was just, it's just an amazing movie. Um, super unique perspective and story to tell and the way they tell it is super creative. Um, and it's, I don't know. It just felt, it felt super personal. Like, uh, I mean, none of us are deaf or anything, but I don't know, like, Sean, you kind of brought it up, like, us all being in, like, rock bands and stuff when we were younger, like, I don't know, it just kind of felt like a, you're able to kind of connect with this guy in a different way than you're usually able to with, um, you know, characters in movies, 
And not that that's something, hopefully none of us will ever, you know, have to go through that, but it's, um, I don't know. It just felt, it just, it was, I connected with it in ways I didn't think I would. And it, um, uh, felt like I got a lot out of it. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was I just mean, really well made and sound design and stuff. It's incredible. Yeah. I think a, a lot of that really does have to do with the performance, the lead performance of Riz, Riz Ahmed. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think it, the movie has so much to say about um, how we connect with people and the, I guess, the medium by which we connect with people and um, what we mean to each other and how much we can affect each other's lives in, in deep and long lasting ways. And um, there are some moments in this movie that, you know, still haunt my thoughts. Um, scenes that just will pop into my head and, and I'll just have to take a second to just like, you know, work through it emotionally again. Um, and, uh, yeah, the amount of just moments of this in this movie that are just so powerful that you can just kind of pull up in your head and, and replay. And, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something else. It's a, it's a, it's an incredible film for sure. Yeah. Um, I had it at number seven and I mean, I'll be honest. I feel like this movie, um, if I was going on pure, just quality, um, it could be nine number one, like easily. I think this movie was, um, extremely authentic. You know, that's where I keep coming back to with it, where how it represent deaf culture with, um, such care and authenticity. It was uh, very mindful with what it was with everything it was doing in this movie. Um, yeah, I mean the sound, the sound editing, the sound alone is is unbelievable. Uh, I wish I was able to see it in theaters. That would have been um, so um, engrossing. And um, and yeah, like it's it really uh, deals with that like struggle of like you know, again, like purpose, like what's your purpose? And, you know, it really, it really shook me. You know, I, I talked about it last, last month on the pod of, um, to me, this movie was very existential and like, you know, if you're, if your passion, if your livelihood is based around this one thing and then you can't do that one thing anymore, um, what do you do? And that is a terrifying thought. And, um, the struggle that he goes through is very real and, um, authentic. You know, I think it, it plays out in a very realistic, but true way. And yeah, again, I think this movie has a lot to say about, um, different cultures and about, um, uh, making life decisions. And also like surprisingly it has like a lot of like subtext about like, um, uh, addiction and, um, addictive like behaviors and what people like, go through like when they're kind of like rehabbing a little bit, like it's not exactly rehab, but it does have like subtext in that, mm-hmm. in that sort of, um, mm-hmm. realm. kind of the phases that they go through of, yeah, of loss. This was my number 10. Honestly, it's the first movie all four of us have picked. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll see if there's a few others, but, uh, this is my number 10. So apparently I hated it compared to you guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. But this film shocked. just this film has it all, and I just also want to bring up the the structure of the movie. I thought was really great, and the journey this character goes on in the passage of time and locations um, really makes you feel like you're going through everything with him. Uh, very novel like, and I love that about this film too. I think you were just uh, offended that um, that I assumed that you would like this movie more because you're a drummer. <laughs> 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 they they nailed the musicianship in this mm. film <laughs> right the style of music it's, it was very cool to see a movie do that yeah that was the other thing it's like the authenticity of the like living as a traveling musician and uh creative art metal art artist world. like yeah. mm-hmm. they nailed it mm. great movie great great movie yeah. um so derek you had that number two sean you also had that number two yep wow correct okay. cool. wow here we are Cool. Oh, wait, we're still at number two. Who, who? Yes. Yeah. So I'm next. Um, my number two is kind of a cheat, but I hinted at it earlier. Small Axe, the complete series. Oh. Hunt. 
What is Nick's number? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Brandon, what is your number two? My number two is Lover's Rock of the Small Axe Anthology. <laughs> So oh, how we deal with this. So punt it, <laughs> punt it then. I mean, we punted for mangrove, so. Yeah, we'll punt it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, true, true, true. We'll punt yeah. it. And we'll have to, yeah, I don't know, Sean, you're the one doing the point system. Maybe you should just make the, maybe you should just make the exact. Yeah, it's all small axe. Right? Let's just do it. It's all it's small axe. It's all small axe, yeah. Okay. Um, so our number ones. Let's oh move on. God. Here we go. Our number ones. So, um. <sighs> I'm, I'm sure Brandon's already Scared. got this figured out what everyone's number one is, but honestly, I'm like pretty lost. I have no idea what your guys' is. I, I know, yeah, I know I what Sean's really is, know. but okay. So Derek, what yeah, what is your what is your number one? I think Brandon knows what my number one is, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, my number one is Kajillionaire. Oh yeah! Wow! Okay. Yeah. Wow, Derek! Damn. That was pretty much from the second I watched it. I was just like, this is exactly like my kind of movie. I don't know. It's like. It really hits like the perfect uh, like hero's journey, like story arc from start to finish. Um, it kind of has like that slight hint of like Wes Anderson vibe to it um, while going into some pretty like auth- like uh, unique and authentic uh, dramatic situations too. Like, um, and it was just kind of it was like it wasn't. I just loved so much that it was able to pull off the, the quirkiness without that being like its brand, you know, like it was quirky for sure. It has like that stuff in it, but it didn't have to sell itself as like the quirky comedy, you know? And, um, because it wasn't like ultimately a lot of the stuff in there is like pretty deep, um, I don't know, stuff about family and, and, um, I thought it was wrapped up in a really clever way. Like mm-hmm. they were able to add a lot to uh, like the parents. Kind of character. a twist almost. Yeah. But that said everything about the characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. Miranda July was the director. Um, I guess she has a couple other movies that are um, very similar. This is like her style that are very much this tone. So I'm interested to check those out and see how they are. So. This yeah. was my number five film. Um, and yeah, this movie is quirky to the max. However, like you were saying, there's some really beautiful scenes throughout. Um, like whether it's the scene at the house with the old man yeah. um, dealing with death and also some great interesting development with her parents or the birth scene in the latter section of the movie that's kind of trippy and surrealistic. Mm-hmm. Um, this movie isn't just quirky though. It excels at that. It also excels at these very personal, interesting, beautiful moments too, with an awesome ending with a cool twist and it concludes great. And Evan Rachel Wood's like unrecognizable in this movie too. Unrecognizable. <laughs> yeah. What the What's hell? her name? What's her character's name? Like old, old Dahlia or old something? Dolio. Or old Dolio. Old Dolio. Old Dolio. Oh my God. Best name ever in a movie. Um, There's a scene where she says it to someone and the person's like, old Dolio. <laughs> it's just the way they say it. Just, yeah. And I mean, I want to reiterate like what you said before, Derek, like you're totally right. Like I, I feel like this movie, like we can list the things that are quirky about it. You know, the bubbles coming out of the yeah. wall and uh, old Dolio just, there's so many quirky things about it, but I don't know, Brandon, I would never like describe this. I would never say to someone, oh yeah, this is a quirky comedy. Yeah. Because yeah, I just, no. it, it, the tone isn't quirky, even though there's all sorts of quirky things happening in it. And it's very dramatic. And I, you know, I don't have it on my top 10, but I definitely enjoyed it. I, I feel like I, I feel like I need to rewatch it or something, but it, it's pretty, it isn't, I just want to say really quick, uh, what we did this year where each of us picked a movie without seeing it of like, I'm going to watch this one. Everyone else should watch it. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting how we did that because it's kind of like calling your shot, but that doesn't mean you're going to like it the most, you know, cause mm-hmm. I picked gazillionaire, but then Derek and Brandon clearly liked it more than I did, you know? And mm-hmm. it's just like, I, I can't help, I'm not trying to take credit or anything, but like, I can't help but wonder, like if I hadn't picked that, like, would you have seen it? You know, it's kind of like a fun game or yeah. something where no, we're like, sure. thank you, Nick. Yeah. We appreciate it. <laughs> I, I need, I needed that. I needed that credit. I'm, um, just kidding. But. It's it's really Nick's win. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to write that Conch- in my journal. Chilling analysis number one is really Nick's win. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I needed that. Oh, boy. Um, great pick, though, Derek. Uh, I'm yep. really happy you have it so high. That's very cool. Your number one was Kajillionaire. Um, so, Sean, what is your yeah. number one? What could my, Sean's number one be? Uh, yeah. Ooh, I wonder. Um, my number one is the uh, movie uh, series. Like, I don't even know what to call it. The anthology film cinematic series, uh, Small Axe. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess we I'm sure we all thought about it. Do we pick our favorite of the series or do we just pick the whole series as a whole? Um, I really personally felt like I, I think looking back to 2020 uh, cinematically, I'm going to look back and think of this movie as the or this these the small acts anthology series as the highlights cinematically of the year. Um, I, I don't think anything even comes close. And perhaps that's because it's it's a different kind of format and it really stands out. But really it is. It's cinematically it is the highlight um, of the year. And I think I'll always come back to that. Um, and so I thought doing anything less than, um, you know, giving the whole series number one would be an injustice to it. Um it's incredible. It's um, the way it looks at, you know, five different aspects of this community um, throughout throughout this history, the history of it from the what the the sixties or fifties through the the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a a holistic, um, com- you know, you feel like you get a a broad sense of the community. Um, and you really feel like you're able to connect to it in a way that that you know only um, Steve McQueen can can do for you. Um, it's uh, yeah, the the broad spectrum of subject matter that it it deals with is incredibly timely and um, really important. Um, and yeah, I. Uh, his skill as a filmmaker is continuously impressive. Um, Did we uh, say Steve McQueen out loud? Yeah, I don't know if you said his name, Steve McQueen. Yeah, Steve, Steve McQueen. McQueen. Did I not say I Steve McQueen? I thought I heard oh, him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought I just said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear him, yeah. It's uh, yeah. He's a, he is an incredible filmmaker, uh, an incredible visual storyteller. The way he is able to control your emotions um, through the way he shoots scenes and the way he, uh, he directs his actors and, um, the way he conceptualizes his, his movies, um, is absolutely remarkable. Um, one of the, if not the best filmmakers working today. Um, and yeah, this is, it's a masterpiece, uh, through and through. So, um, Steve McQueen went from having, uh, he went from having four feature lengths to having, um, (laughs) eight or seven yeah yeah we we also nine. kind of started our year watching hunger um and then oh, kind yeah. of yeah, concluded right. it watching yeah. the small acts on mm-hmm. this podcast very true very true yeah. yeah i had this at number two um and i i mean i agree with everything you said sean um the reason i honestly the reason i had number two was because of the cheat aspect of it i just like you know i'm kind of I don't know. I I can be kind of weird with uh, whether or not it's a movie or not. You know, I think a few years back, like I, I was like, OJ made in America is not a movie, you know? And, uh, even though it's like one of the best things ever, but you know, um, I, I was like, I just had to admit with small acts though, that, that the, some of its parts made, um, made the whole product better. Like each one of the, each one of the movies was great. You know, each one was really good to great. Um, you know, three and a, four, four stars minimum. Some of them were four and a half, but altogether it was a five star piece, you know? And, Absolutely. um, I really thought that, uh, you know, you could watch them out of order, but I do think that the order made a difference. Um, I think that there were a lot of themes that were echoed throughout the, throughout the project and um they uh they always like it was almost like each movie was uh like ended a little early you know like uh like like 
it didn't need to be wrapped up because mm. there was going to be another one, you know? So like the, the, a story might end, but like the next one kind of picks up where the whole series left off. And, um, I found that that experience of seeing them all together, um, really made like, um, really enhanced my overall experience. And I like, I learned a lot and I saw a lot and, uh, you know, the, the whole thing was just really, really powerful, you know, and, uh, Steve McQueen. Yeah. He's just got away with the camera, you know I mean? Uh, talking about, I mentioned it earlier, talking about lingering, you know, uh, he did totally different type of lingering than the invisible man, but I felt like he would just leave the camera on places and you would just like see the action that's happening in the scene. There was one, I can't remember which one I think was the third one. There was a shot where he just like followed a bird you know, for a while. And it just like, I was just like engrossed by it. You know, <laughs> he just like, he's just so good at, at timing and knowing what to give you and when to move on. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, again, like very timely for this year, a lot of like black lives matter type stuff, but also this was like a British movie and, um, it was about, uh, a culture of, uh, immigrants and, um, trying to find their place in the world. And, Again, a culture that is hardly ever seen on film. So, uh, yeah, I just, I'm with you, Sean. I, I just thought this was fantastic. I want to say screw the sum of all the parts because the film <laughs> Lovers Rock on its own, just to show, just to tell you guys like how great these are individually, too. I, I picked Lovers Rock on its own independently as my number two. And I know you guys probably feel the same about Mangrove or some of the others. But this film really moved me. It's so special, so unique. There's nothing like it that exists. One house party in one night. Sweaty bodies Wedding like walls. smashing up against each other to mm-hmm. these deep West Indies reggae music. Um, to the like extended seven-minute acapella shot of them concluding the song together. There's just so much joy in this film. And uh, it was an incredible experience that somehow was under like 65 minutes. I don't know how he pulled that off. Um, Lover's yeah. Rock to me was pretty much a masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, Lover's Lock Rock was definitely something very, very special. Remember that movie, uh, Climax, you know, and like, yeah. I remember yeah. how much I hated Climax. Like I wish that Climax was like Lover's Rock where it was just like a fun party, you know, and uh, you what got to comparison. know like the culture and stuff. But yeah, um, I, I, you know, I didn't mean to bring up climax, but yeah, I, I hear you. Like it was a very like, yeah, there's no other real movie like, like lovers rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's one, two, two. Mangrove, and where's yours, Derek? Mangrove was my number three. Ooh. So um, all so high. Yeah. And mangrove, um, uh, you know, likewise, um, was just incredible. I like, it's so hard to describe his directing. I think he did it pretty good though, Nick. He's just like, he just knows like the best way to do everything. And it's like, there's all these different skilled directors that we love and stuff, but it's like when comparing and like thinking of, I don't, it's just like, for some reason, it's not even that complicated. Like it's a courtroom scene. I don't know. Maybe it is complicated, but he, (laughs) he just does it so perfectly. Just everything is just so well done. He's and definitely, like, yeah, he's definitely one of those filmmakers where you can't, I, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't, I don't like understand what, what, what he's he doing. Do that is so that, good. Yeah. Like he, he just, it's, yeah, it's incredible. It's just, I don't understand sum of everything why it's so that good, they, but you know, it that hits doing. me so hard emotionally. Yeah. yeah. The monologue in Mangrove just like broke yeah. my heart. Yeah. Yeah, so Mangrove's great, Lovers Rock's great, Small Axe Red, White, great. And blue. Uh, oh, yeah. What do you do? You guys think? Uh, not to get too sidetracked, but do you think they're gonna like? Can he get nominated for like best director for that? You think? I think he's gonna get screwed over. Oh. Like I think yeah. that the Academy is not gonna know what to do with uh, just Small Ignore Axe. it. And yeah. so I don't think I don't think he's gonna get like anything. I it did don't have. Think, it did have a small theatrical release, didn't it? Did. At least a couple of yeah, them. Yeah, they qualified it, but. But I don't think I don't think the voters are gonna like know what to do. Right. So I don't think they're gonna do anything. I don't think it's gonna get anything personally. Wow. But um, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But um, 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could be wrong. I could totally be wrong, but mm-hmm. um, like what performance would you like have all the small action movies like which, you know, who would Who's you be like, oh, yeah, that one has to be nominated for best picture. Like, I feel like this, the other thing about the series is that it's so subtle in a lot of ways and there aren't any like, you know, there's no like huge actor in them so you can't be like oh yeah that's the guy who's got to get nominated although John Boyega like, is pretty big John Boyega I guess is, that's the closest big, one yeah and he was great he was super mm. great but you know I I think I think uh, he, he should be nominated for best director that's like my thing is like yeah. gosh yeah definitely he should be nominated for best director and even if it's just for Lover's Rock you know just uh, he should just be nominated <laughs> for best director yeah but, um okay so uh, that was Sean's number one. So uh, so it's my number one. Okay, so my number one is First Cow. What? Whoa. Yeah. Nick, Nick. I literally already what? put in your number one on the no. list. What, what I was, was it? sure it was uh, I'm thinking of ending things. Oh, no, I punted on that. That was my number four. Yeah. Uh, my, I will oops. say my. Well, you guys no. should definitely take a look at the list. I will say my one through four were uh, were all contenders to be number one. Like I'm thinking of anything that definitely could have been my number one. Um, I ended up going with First Cow kind of just based on the year that 2020 was. Um, it was it was you know a pretty tough year, and I felt like First Cow was like the wholesome movie that um, that I needed. You know, I I'm I'm a pretty big fan of uh, the Biscuits. director Kelly. Kelly Reihard and um, I've seen all of her movies at this point and she makes these really quiet true to life movies um, that are often about travel and survival and um, I was talking to my wife about uh, her um, as a director she's she's a she's been a fan of her work since day one and um, I was, I was kind of making a joke about how uh, tense this movie is. Like, I was like, oh man, we're watching a thriller right now. And I like, I said it like in that tone and she was like, are you serious? And I was like, no, actually, yeah, this movie is like pretty tense, you know? And I kind of, we start talking about how, like, I feel like it's, it's one of her more tense movies. And she was kind of like, all of her movies are tense. Like they're all kind of like pretty tense, but also they're, they're also very regular, like they're, they're day to day. Like it, her movies are about the anxieties of your day to day life and the, the tension that comes when you're just trying to survive. And, um, this movie I thought was like incredibly special because it, it was, it was a Western, you know, it was about moving to Oregon and during the, you know, the Oregon trail days. And, um, it's about a guy who was, more of like a nurturing kind of person. Like you think about the West, you think of Clint Eastwood, you think of uh, John Wayne and you don't think about a guy who wants to open a bakery and sell pastries to um, other people on the frontier. <laughs> um, and, but that's what they did. You know, this guy, but he, he doesn't have any butter. Yeah. He doesn't have any butter. So he starts like they, they steal the milk. It's a heist movie. Um, really? It really is. It's a heist <laughs> movie. And so he, he steals the milk, um, but he does it in such a, he, you know, they sneak out during the night and then he has his little stool and he sits there and he says hi to the cow <laughs> so and cute. he talks to her and he, te- you know, they, he tells her stories and they kind of like have a intimate connection as he's milking her. And, uh, and then he, he tells, tells her the, how how much everyone likes the pastries and the the butter from it from her milk. Yeah, and <laughs> and she loves it, and they love each other. And also, like he, he has like a, a best friend who, um, you know, there's um, they're kind of their partners, and he. He, his friend, uh, what's his name? King Lou. Um, mm-hmm. his, his he's more of a um, ambitious type. Um, but they, they feed off each other really well. And they're just like, they're, you could just tell they're just, they just really care deeply about each other. And it was, um, you know, it was just the sort of movie that I think is perfect for this year where there's, there's, uh, it's mostly wholesome, but there was tension and you're just trying to survive. And I, I think it was Kelly Reinhardt's best movie. Um, and, uh, I just, I, I just think she's great. And I thought the movie was great. So that's first cow. Yeah, that was my number eight. Um, yeah, I just 
agree with pretty much everything you said. It's just really a sweet, lovely movie. Um, it was done really, really well. It's just like a completely unique like story to tell. Yeah. Not many movies like it. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know many movies about cows in general, <laughs> but uh, especially Westerns like that. You guys are not alone on that. This is like definitely one of the highest regarded movies. It's on so many like top threes. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's pretty crazy seeing the praise at the end of the year. And I loved it. Definitely a top 20 for me as well. I also didn't even think about, (laughs) I never knew that. I don't know why I didn't know this. The cows were like not over here at the time. So like (laughs) there just wasn't any milk. Yeah, that's crazy, yeah. guys. <laughs> no, no, don't. don't. <laughs> Who would have it, thought? Really, it really is funny to think about that way. Where like, like when they first start selling the pastries, and like, they're like, what is? The, people are asking, like, what is this? And King Lou, you know, he's like this Chinese man. He's going, oh, Asian Chinese secret. You know, he's like playing it up. Like, uh, um, it's just milk. It's just yeah. milk that they're they're stealing because from the one cow that's in the area. But mm-hmm. um, yep. butter yeah. is delicious. Yeah, yeah, I, I rewatched it with Shen, and uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna watch it a lot more in my um, time here on this planet. So, um, uh, yeah, first cow, that was my Sweet. number one. Yeah. So, Brandon, mm-hmm. what is your number one? What could it be? Um. Yeah, I was punting this all through the episode. I'm <laughs> glad all you guys are pretty on board with it as well. Uh, my number one of the year is uh, Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things. This, nice. Yep. This movie is remarkable, and it is so deep and hard to follow, and you got to decipher it and figure out what it's trying to tell you. But even if you don't necessarily get it on its first listen, watch, there's still so much to enjoy and see and hear the dialogue in like in the opening, like 25 minute car ride is super engaging. I didn't get bored for a second. Like Charlie Kaufman is a brilliant writer and just hearing the banter between uh, these two, you know, Jesse Buckley and Jesse. And Jesse Pl- Plemons, are there both names? Yeah. Jesse, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that confused me. Um, Tony Collette is amazing, and David uh, Thewlis is amazing as well. Um, it, yeah, the the three act structure of this film is really fascinating, and like I mentioned, the opening a third in the car, but when they get to the family's house, um, kind of turns in, turns in this like twisted horror movie for a bit there with just outstanding visuals and like psychedelic things happening to this family in this house. So trippy. Mm-hmm. So trippy. Um, you know, watch this movie high if you want, but I can't wait to revisit this film and just f- explore its deeper meanings and ideas that it has going on because there is more than you could possibly get just on one watch. Um, Charlie Kaufman's an incredible visual director on top of his writing, and it's cool seeing that come into like full effect into this film because he is just starting to become, um, you know, he's just starting to tackle his own scripts as a director. And it's his I, third movie. It's only his like, third movie. Yeah, whereas like, you know, we all know him from, you know, Eternal Sunshine's Palace Mind and Adaptation, those are two of my favorites. But being yeah, John Malkovich, Malkovich. but yeah, John Malkovich. his his directing is out of control amazing. Um on top of his um, already incredible writing that we know him from. So yeah, this is the best movie of the year for me. I yeah, loved I mean, it. I mean just the fact that he, he, how long was that opening scene in the car is like like thirty you know, half half hour. thirty, thirty five minutes of just two people talking in the car. And the variety of, of shots that he um, he covered that scene with was incredible. And like it, going from outside the car to inside the car and all these different um, really interesting shots uh, is, I think, really it livened up this, the, um, the sequence and <clears throat> made it a lot more, gave a lot more tension to the movie, the way he cut that that scene, if you call it a scene, I don't know, it was like 35 minutes long, but, um, 
<clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a, a deft hand. Yeah, um, see, really creative filmmaker. I think that this movie we we've talked a lot in this episode about like a pure vision, and I think this is another one that is uh, a, a a very pure vision. Um, I you know. Brandon, I, I second everything you said. Um, I think Charlie Kaufman is becoming a better and better director. I think this is easily his best directed movie. Um, I wasn't super into Anomalisa and um, the one before that, Synecdoche, New York, I thought was like <laughs> incredible, but also like I never want to watch it. <laughs> but um, like, I don't know. I feel like this movie was like so purely Charlie Kaufman. Like it was like full of anxiety and self-awareness and uh, uh, references that you're not going to get unless you research them. You know, like that scene we keep talking about where they're driving, like there's a part where she starts talking about uh, the John Cassavetes movie, um, uh, uh, the, the scent of a woman, not the scent of a woman, um, uh, a woman under the influence. And they start talking about a specific review of that movie. And <laughs> she's actually quoting that review. And, and you know, that again is more about the, the things that are going on deeper in this movie. Like this movie has a whole, in the third act is like a whole different crazy experience. And, you know, there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to explore. There's all these different things going on. And also I want to add that Charlie Kaufman, I think is very aware that it can come across as pretentious. Like there's all these, like there's a part in the movie where, uh, they're watching a Robert Zemeckis, like one of the characters is watching a Robert Zemeckis movie, but it's a, not a real Zemeckis movie. It's like a parody. Mm-hmm. And I think that is like a hint that like, it's like Kaufman knows that like, that's a parody of Zemeckis and he's kind of being a parody of himself by making such a convoluted, weird movie. But like, also that's true mm-hmm. to who he is and it's directed and really well. And it's a great <laughs> movie. You know, it's like, it's like, yeah, you can look at it like it's pretentious and just shrug it off. But also it's like a really incredible piece of filmmaking that I was enthralled with the entire time. I love that he dabbled in horror. Like there were some pretty tense parts of this movie and then the whole movie kind of flips in the third act and it's like you're the whole perspective kind of changes and it's um brandon i'm so happy that you had it number one like i i'm psyched uh i i i really considered it for number one and say all your guys's numbers as well it was yeah seven for me this was my uh six yeah six but yeah, Brandon, you know, I never know like movies like this. I never know if you're going to love them or not. You know, where like it was incredibly stylized, like mm-hmm. the style was, you know, off the wall, which I know is like your your favorite thing with movies. I would say you love style and like drama, <laughs> but um, but like often you don't like subtext. You know, like you don't like to like dig into like the meaning of movies and stuff. And I felt like this movie was like full of that type of stuff. So when I got done watching it, I was like, my one of my first thoughts was like, I wonder if Brand's going to like this. Like he's either going to love it or he's going to be like too much for me or something, yeah. you know, as with everybody, probably as well. <laughs> this is such a polarizing yeah. movie and yeah. absolutely not for everyone. Yeah, right. I feel like this this movie is like really, it, like Nick said, it, it really drags you through it. it. Every moment's really interesting, but it's just, it's pulling you along by a thread. And you're like, you're barely going along with it in, in a lot of ways, at least like kind of conceptually and, mm-hmm. and how you're viewing it. And then like when the movie's over, you're just kind of, all right, now let's let's figure that thing out. And I, I felt like, a lot of the enjoyment, if not like more of the enjoyment of, of movies like this and this movie are is, uh, is afterwards trying to piece it together and, and working through all the ideas and working through all the little, little breadcrumbs that he, he lays along the way. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, again, I, I said this in the review, but me and Kelly talked about this movie for like, over an hour after after we finished watching it uh and it it's a pretty incredible filmmaker that can do something like that nice so yeah so those brands number one i'm thinking of ending things uh it's on netflix charlie coffin's uh new movie so um with that that's all of our uh that's all that's all of our picks so uh sean do you want to run the calculations 
Crunch some numbers. Crunch the numbers here. Did, did everyone go through and? Yep. I double check everything? mine. Mine are correct. And then Definitely uh, correct. I can I can do a drum roll maybe you know number ten. Yep. Grrr, I need to. And then on one second. I need to uh, turn those numbers back on, and I'm gonna do it. Here we go. Grrr. Number okay. ten. Number ten. Uh-oh, I'm gonna do. Did you, Z to, did, did you Z to double A. check? Did you double check the extra points? You did. Did you double I, check? I think I did. I did a few times. I don't know if anyone wants to go through it. Yep, I don't they think look we, good. It's pretty easy. I don't think we had a single um, two uh, two points. So uh, any movie that uh, oh, it was like either two people had. agreed or all four of us agreed. Never, right. never three of us agreed. Hmm. That's surprising. Um, does that look right, Derek? Yes. All right, cool. So at our number 10, uh, number 10 with 10 points is The Vast of Night. Ooh. Num- oh, well, well, that, sorry. Yeah, that was that was number 10. Um, so, uh, at number nine is Promising Young Woman with 11 points. Uh, there's a tie for 12 points is uh, Palm Springs and Soul. Oh. Hmm. So that would be number um, with, uh, eight uh, and seven. Yeah, which I, I guess Palms, uh, we talked about this last year. We didn't talk about it this year, but Palm Springs would be um, ahead because it, it made it higher on someone's list. Cool. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And okay. then at number six is First Cow with 14 points. Nice. Um, with 15 points, uh, number five is Weathering with You. 17 points uh, at number four is Kajillionaire. Um, at number three, top three, here we go. Drum roll. Uh, with 26 points is Sound of Metal. Okay. Uh, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, and we all, th- for our top three, we all th- all four had uh, the movie on our list. Yeah, unanimous. Unanimously. Uh, at number two is I'm Thinking of Ending Things with 29 points. Unanimous as well. And a resounding victory um, at 39 points for number one is Small Axe, the series. Nice. Small Axe Anthology Damn. series. Wow. Wow. That's a cool top three of all of us agreeing. Mm-hmm. Um, all of us unanimously putting the top three on our list yeah, somewhere. Absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Absolutely. That's really cool. Um, well, great guys. That was super fun. Um, uh, you know, I'm glad we, I'm glad we did that. Good, good picks, good mm-hmm. movies, good year for movies. I think, um, you know, the theater experiences aren't, you know, you could talk all day about box office and the state of the movies with that. But in my opinion, Quality wise, movies are still like, yeah, there's good movies coming out. Outstanding year. Look for them. Yeah. So um, with that, I think we should sign off. Uh, That was our top 10 of 2020 of 2020. So um, next time you see us, we will be going live on YouTube and uh, we'll be weekly on Tuesdays. So we will have weekly podcasts um, every Tuesday, shorter episodes, more in depth. Uh, only two of us typically, but, uh, you know, there will be times it'll be all four of us. So, um, uh, do you guys have anything to add? Are we going to do like honorable mentions or anything or are we over, over time? Over it. We're over, time, over it. But, right. but I mean, yeah, there's, there's other movies that we could mention, but, mm-hmm. uh, just go I mean, see, just, just go see all the movies. Yeah. There's yeah, a I mean, lot of them. Go yeah. see Scare them. me. That was my, I want to have it number 10, but Scare I remember really going good. with the the vast of night, but, um, All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we covered most of the movies, I think. So mm-hmm. anyway, uh, that was, uh, 2020. Uh, thanks for listening and keep watching. Bye. Bye. Bye.